configure at this time. Yes, what should we say? verses, and I pray that we live it out in our lives, we understand it in our hearts. 
and uh, that we would uphold it as truth. And uh, I just pray that, again, that you allow me to decrease, that you alone would increase. I pray that the message, again, would be would be clear, that, that uh, you just direct my words, direct my thoughts, that, that we'd be able to obtain this, what it is that you have for us from these verses here today, 2019. And uh, I just pray that you would challenge our steps now in Jesus' name. Amen. I think of uh, great importance in the day that we live. I'm not trying to get political here, but it is it is alarming, saddening. I can almost say angering. That's the correct word to use. When you hear of the uh, state of New York, not following up from last week and uh, sanctity of human life, um, making the decision that they would allow abortion all the way up to birth, all the way up to nine months. And then our uh, new governor making a proclamation that he wants our state to be the leader in all things in essence of abortion. Uh, kind of making it clear that his intentions are to equal or even for, and he can't go beyond New York, but to at least equal it. And uh, it becomes a very reality of, of where do we stand, what are we going to stand for, and uh, how are we going to do it, ultimately, is what this all boils down to. And uh, as I consider kind of along the legal terms, and these, not, these two words aren't necessarily legal terms, uh, but the truths that surround them fall into the realm of, of the legalities of the law. Uh, two terms, uh, conviction or, or tradition, or you say it this way, conviction or preference. Uh, our Constitution is designed such, and I don't know if it's always... Uh, interpreted this way by our justice system, but it's designed to protect conviction. But it is not designed to protect preference. And uh, I think as we grow up closer to the Lord's return, we need to know what it is that is our convictions in our life, and live it, and, and, uh, and it truly be us, and uh, make sure that we're not just having preferences. Um, I, I think that... Uh, the very reality in many cases. Now, across the board, I think you can have different, a little different spectrum, but in many particular cases, um, that which we thought were convictions of our heart, the courts are really, no, that's really just a preference in your heart. And we're not going to hold it. And uh, it's a challenge to us. Is this truly a conviction? David Gibbs, we talked about him last Sunday, in fact, from the uh, Christian Law Association. I believe he was from Florida, I thought. Someone else on Florida or something, but now I believe the organization is like in Virginia or something, if I recall. Nonetheless, conservative, uh, conservative Christian Americans, uh, Christian Law Association, CLA, uh, the founder, <laughs> director David Gibbs, uh, put out a uh, kind of a, a definition between the difference of, of these terms of conviction or preference. Let me tell you how he defined a preference. Because frankly, as I look at his definition of what a preference is, I think there's a lot of Christians that would say, no, that's a conviction. Let me read it. A preference is, in legal terms, a very strong belief held with great strength. Many have and will give their entire life to the service of that preference. Many have and will use their fortunes in the name of that preference. It is also very possible to proselytize in the name of that preference. And you can boldly teach others and your children about the importance of that preference. But those definitions do not make it a conviction. We think about so much of our faith, and I guess that's a question for us to consider. Is the reality of our faith, is it a conviction? Or is it just a preference? When we look at what the legal definition, according to David Gibbs, is as far as a preference goes, do we have a very strong belief in something? I hope so. Uh, are we holding it with great strength? I, I certainly hope so. Will we give our entire lives in service for what we believe in? Yes, I, I would have desired so. And many will and have continued to use their fortunes, their wealth, their, their, their time to invest in that and proselytize for it and teach to the next generation. <laughs> But the course will say that's just a preference, not a conviction. And uh, I think it's an, uh, an amazing reality when we consider, well, if that is just a preference, what makes 
a conviction. And he said it in just a very short term. This is what David gives to define the conviction. Because again, this is lower than legal terms. The conviction is not something that you discover, quote unquote, but something that you purpose in your hearts. In other words, we can have a preference that we hold very dear and true to our hearts. We'll fight for it. We'll die for it. We'll teach others for it. But what makes it a conviction is not those things, but the very reality that it is who we are. It is a purpose in our heart, and it has become who we are. A preference, I'll say it this way, although this is my definition, not David Gibbs anymore. This is what I'll define it. Preference, although a strong belief, is the belief that can change under the right circumstances. What are some circumstances that will change what we think of a conviction, but make it a very reality that it's actually just a preference? Peer pressure. If you must, um, if you must have company before you'll stand for it, if you have to have peer support before you'll stand for it. It's just a preference. It's not a conviction. If if your decision uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, waffles a little bit when the others begin to run from it, it's not a conviction. It's just a preference. Now we'll think it's a conviction. We'll declare it and define it as a conviction. But it ultimately is just a preference. We have family pressure that says, no, you don't need to do that. You don't need to believe that. You don't need to be that way. And uh, again, we begin to uh, question. It's not a conviction. It's a, it's a preference. Uh, if the presence of lawsuits will get us to back down, it's not a conviction. It's a preference. If the threat of jail or even of death will make us change our minds, it's not a conviction. It's a preference. A conviction is a belief that will not and cannot change. Why? Because a man believes that it is God that has required nothing. My convictions are those things, not just that I think are strong and true and I'll die for supporting, but my convictions are the very reality of my heart that I say, thus saith God, therefore I cannot nor will I ever change my thinking on these truths. It doesn't matter who stands with me or who stands against me. It doesn't matter what the threat of jail or, or death is. Uh, when I have an understanding, this is what God has said. And therefore, I cannot fluctuate to the left or to the right. Then it becomes a conviction. I, I can teach my kids a whole host of things that I think are very important. And, and I like to call them convictions of my heart. But if I'm not willing to stand for them and realize that this is God... That is indicated. That's why I'm standing for it, because God has said, not because I have said. Now, you, those that know me know that I have a uh, a strong, uh, jokingly, I'll say it this way, conviction against peanut butter. <laughs> but I can say this as well. If my gun was pointed to my head and someone told me, eat the peanut butter, I'm not dying for it. I'm going to eat the peanut butter. Uh, it's a very, 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 very strong preference of mine. But I have not, I'm not standing here to say, thus saith the Lord, our good Lord shall never have peanut butter. <laughs> I'm saying, thus saith art, I really would, would not care if I never had to eat this ever again in my life. And I stand strongly on that. But... I don't stand here with God's authority by saying, Thou shalt not. Well, let's consider a couple things before we dive into these verses. The verses are, we understand them, I think. They're very simple. It probably even defines what the truths are. But let, let me kind of illustrate the whole idea of conviction and preference as, as we begin. Do we believe that the Bible is the sole authority of faith and practice? I hope so. You're looking for what is what is the authority of our lives, of our church, of our ministry, of our hearts, of our lives. I hope that we would say, in unity, it's the Word of God. The Word of God. If we were brought to court, and they were charging us with the very reality that um, this is irrelevant to life today, could we say, no, I have a conviction that this is very relevant to my heart and life today? I would hope that we would all be able to say that. Now, a even halfway good attorney could flip through the pages of this word and look to us and say, if that is the case, then what are you doing about this? 
conviction or preference. You say that this is the sole authority of your life. We nod our heads and say, well, yeah, that's exactly right. I don't think that we should say that we need to get rid of this in the United States of America. The Bible should still be printed and made available, and we stand as that as a conviction of our hearts. That is truth. But the attorney will just have to flip a few pages and say, all right, if you're going to say that, then what about this? Is that true to your life? Mm. No. People are saying, well, what about that? Is this a conviction of your heart, or is it just something that you say out of your mouth? Is it a conviction? Or is it really ultimately just a very strong preference that we have? You know, our very testimony, I think, in the, sadly, and I never thought it would have to be this way, but I think our very testimony in the land that we live today, can I say it this way? In the state that we live today, in the state of Illinois that we live today, I think our convictions are going to be brought to court and be challenged quickly. And it doesn't take a very skilled lawyer or attorney to point to some passage of the Word of God and say, if this is a conviction, then why are you not doing this? Why are you ignoring this? And our testimony as far as even the authority of the Word of God in our life, I dare say there's probably not too many Christians that can stand in court and say, it is a conviction of my heart guarded by the Constitution of the United States that the Word of God is the sole authority of my life. That an attorney could not disprove that. And that's a sad state. Secondly, we consider the work of Christ, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, accomplishment of the cross, conviction or preference for us. It's not coincidental that marriages are under attack today. Even the whole concept of marriage is under attack today. It's alarming uh, the statistics of, of what they are trying to define as marriage today. Uh, just last night we had a Christmas party. And uh, a comment was made, and I know there's many that have done this, somebody that was a, an ordained minister just for the sake of being able to marry a brother or a sister or a good friend. People that are getting ordained to the ministry so that they have a recognized license to perform a wedding ceremony who may not may or may not have any understanding of the word of god i forget what the church of the church of california you spend 110 dollars to them and uh, tell them sign a piece of paper they'll send you back an ordination certificate you know you're now ordained in the state of illinois to give weddings well, where where is where's the reality of truth where's the reality of the word of god where's the reality of marriage and what 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 how is it a priority anymore do you know, uh, again, marriage is one of the very, in the Word of God, it is the, the, the soul, really, the soul, what do you call that, uh, uh, illustration of what Christ has done for us. Our adversary of the devil is going to do all that he can to attack and destroy the very sanctity of marriage. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ being demonstrated by what Christ does to his church, by being demonstrated by our marriage. You know, again, if we were to stand in court and say, yes, the gospel is still truth, and that the attorney pointing his finger back at us and said, but is it? Is it a conviction of yours or is that just a preference? I know these are legal terms and uh, we're looking at the word of God, which is truth, regardless of what legalities are, but uh, I think it challenges us in that regard. Conviction or preference? Not just because I take a strong stand <laughs> behind it for time, that does not make it a conviction. Just because I share it with others and teach it to my kids, that does not make it a conviction. Just because I spend every Sunday discussing my faith, that doesn't make it a conviction. But what happens when things get bumpy? What happens when I find myself standing alone? When I see that there's a cost involved? When I have to suffer a little bit? When I can't put myself first? When my co-workers mock me? When I find something new that seems to be more interesting? <laughs> Glittery? <laughs> Shiny? What happens when I just don't feel like it anymore? Is the very reality and the essence of my faith truly a conviction? Or are we living a preference? Fiddler on the Riff, I've, well, yeah, it's been a while since we've watched that. There's something, something very classy about the Fiddler on the Riff. And again, if I was a little more bolder, I'd break into the song of tradition. 
I can guarantee you probably this afternoon I will in my own home. And my two daughters will roll their eyes at me and say, Dad, you always have to be so loud. <laughs> you know, if you recall in the, uh, the, the, the presentation of Fiddler on the Rift, first daughter announces that she has pledged her love and her life to a tailor. Even though the father has already pledged her love and life to a widower butcher. And I think that's the first time that we hear the very song tradition. How can we break with tradition? I'm the one that's supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be telling my daughter who she's going to marry. And now my daughter, oh, this is not what he says, but it has Now my daughter has shown them who she's going to marry. This is a breaking tradition. But as he sings to himself, he convinces himself that, you know, I guess even tradition can go set aside. Second daughter announces that she has pledged her love and life to an idealist. And again, he sings another song to himself and again realizes that although tradition is very important to him, again, he will set that one aside. Then the third daughter announces that she's going to marry a Gentile. Oh. Now traditions are very important to him. Now all that he has stood for cannot be broken, they cannot be shaken. And uh, he, I think at one point he says, um, if I try to bend that far, I'll break. And then in his little jingle, but on the other hand, and then he stops, no, there is no other hand. And his very, uh, it's a tradition, but we'll allow it. It's a tradition, but we'll allow it. It's a Whoa, I am not going to allow that. Oh, really? It's just a preference. It really is. He's proven by his actions, and the same as we do. It's really not a conviction until it reaches the point that we refuse to bend. But it truly is a preference because we can see how many times that we will bend. And uh, can I challenge us? What is our conviction in our life? Look at these verses. Again, familiar verses. Easy verses to grasp. The power of true conviction. This is talking in regards to the Holy Spirit. We want to look first off at the conviction of the world. Three points here. <laughs> You're going to see that these are very familiar if you go through them. Verse 8. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. We think along the lines of the conviction that is going to take place in regards to the lost world, the, the dying world. There is going to be a conviction of sin, verse 9, because they believe not on me. Uh, it is said that between October 27th and December 3rd of, I think it was 1906, uh, Billy Sunday was in Kiwani, October 27th, December 3rd. It says that two to 3,000 people came each night. I can't imagine that. In Kiwani. The Star Courier, this is amazing to me, the Star Courier on December 4th, so the day after it ended, printed the names of every person that was saved and baptized during Billy Sunday's time here in Kiwani. The list contained 3,018 names. 3,018 names of people that were printed in a paper and being saved and baptized. Churches, ministries. Uh, believers uh, have often, uh, like Billy said, now I'm not legitimizing, I'm not diminishing salvation. I don't know who these people are. I don't know what they're truly saying. I don't know any of those details. But I do know, and we did this for us PBS many years ago. Uh, uh, every uh, night I would dress up like Billy Sunday and had my uh, my magical bat. And I, now it's not as hard to do. But then I had to put some baby powder in my head to make my hair all white. And I had on a uh, a baseball, like a, a 1910-ish, as old as I could find looking baseball jersey. And, uh, you know, the socks pulled way up and, and I kind of hobbled in here because after all, I'm like a hundred and some years old, uh, coming to share with them about Billy Sunday and uh, uh, the truths of the gospel in that time frame. I, I enjoyed that. I was a little out of my comfort zone, um, but we did have Stanley Stumble to help me along through that as well. Uh, but not, anyway, we, what you know, probably we all know about Billy Sunday, besides the antics of jumping up on top of pianos and whatnot, and on top of pulpits and preaching, and, and that he was a very strong uh, opponent to all details that had to do with alcohol. 
and uh, bars would shut down when he came into town, which I think would be a great advantage. You know, when we look at the aspect of the conviction of sin, so many times we, we define that sin as whatever it is that ails us. Let's say it that way. Uh, the conviction of sin, and we look at that sin as hard as Billy Sunday would have, the, the very the, the sinfulness of alcohol. And others will look at it as the sinfulness of, of this or the sinfulness of that. And we come up with our, our list of sins that, boy, somebody needs to be convicted of. But ultimately, how is the Bible defined the specific sin that the Holy Spirit convicts against? It's not about alcohol. It's not about drugs. It's not about abusing our, our spouses. It's not about uh, a, a child neglect. It's not about uh, laziness or theft or, or even murder. It's a sin of what? Not believing Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and convicts us of the ultimate sin of not believing in Christ. I fear that there's a lot of, uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I think there's a lot of ministries and organizations that I think are very crucial, very important, as far as helping people with their uh, their sin habits. But I trust that we understand that ultimately what the Holy Spirit is coming is not to convict us of all of that, but to convict us of the most important. And once that is taken care of, all these others will get taken care of as well. But I think there's a lot of people that have had their lives cleaned up and assume that means they're saved. All they did was make again back to Wednesday. They made a choice. I, I'm not going to do that anymore. And they wrongly interpret that because I'm no longer drinking, not because I'm saved. By the grace of God, I'm no longer uh, in bondage to, to alcohol. But by the grace of God, do you understand what it is to truly believe in God? Do you truly understand what it is to truly believe in Christ? The convict of sin, specifically, this one sin. Of unbelief, the sin of unbelief. Continues on here is a continued conviction of, of the world. The convict of, of righteousness. Again, specifically, because I go to my Father and you don't, you won't see me anymore. In other words, the Holy Spirit is coming to convict us of righteousness, to convict the world of righteousness. In the absence, so to speak, the physical absence of Christ, to remind the world of what true righteousness is all about. The unbelieving Jew is the victim of the sin of unbelief by declaring the truth of Christ. The unbelieving Gentile is the exact same way. Let us well again look at verse 11. To convict of judgment. Judgment, verse 11, because the prince of this world is, is judged. The Holy Spirit was not the one to cast judgment upon Satan, but the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to convict the world in the very reality of that judgment. And uh, are we aware of that very judgment and the very conviction that the Holy Spirit, His very work does here on this earth? Convicting the world of sin, specifically the sin of unbelief. We can fix a lot of other things just by this decision. We can fix a lot of other sins just by, uh, uh, what do you call that, a uh, learned behavior. But, but if we aren't being convicted by the very reality of unbelief, um, we're missing. We're missing the very reality of the Holy Spirit. And uh, righteousness because Christ is no longer here of judgment because of the very reality of the judgment upon our adversary. And though, notice very quickly, again, you'll notice the same three points. Creation of the world, but what about the work in salvation? This is cries out, the work of the Holy Spirit cries out, a work of salvation in the lost world, the lost and dying world that surrounds us. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up and declares Christ. Verse 22, he says, You men of Israel. Notice that Peter's not preaching to the church. The church hasn't been necessarily formed yet at this point. He's preaching to the very same people that just a few days ago, 40 some days ago, cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Peter stands up and says, You men of Israel. Verse 23, he points out that it was their wicked hands that crucified Christ. And in verse 36, he gives this invitation, this conclusion. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, to put it in the modern day vernacular, it's almost a got the mic <laughs> uh, scenario. Uh, the one that you have crucified, the one that you killed, the one that you said crucify him, crucify him, the one that you saw hanging on that cross. Our God made him Lord and Savior. And it's almost like Peter's put. All I need to say. 
That's all I need to say. Do we grasp the very reality of what Peter is saying here? And it says in the very next verse, verse 37, Now when they heard this, what do you think their response was? They were angered in their hearts towards Peter for the absurd accusations that he made against them. How dare him! Now it says in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? What has become of us? What is the very reality? In verse 38, Peter gives them the answer, repent. We baptize every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Here's a point in regards to that salvation. We need to be careful that the salvation that we present is nothing more than just a preference. Truly, it's a conviction. Notice the conviction again. It's a message of sin. What sin? Sin of unbelief. Again, I mentioned I was already ahead of myself, but again, how often do does the salvation message get and get? And, and it should. I think it should. And we can see it in the gospel taking this same effect, and certainly in the in Acts and the the first church there. The presentation of the gospel kind of takes on an individual level on where they are and, and how it's presented kind of uh, changes. The gospel doesn't change, but the presentation of it does. But do we understand that this message is a message of the very reality of the conviction of sin, the sin of unbelief? Not the sin of fill in the blank, but the sin of unbelief. We have to be reminded, we have brought, to be brought right to the foot of the cross to be challenged with that very reality of that. This is not, I'm not taking the salvation to fix my life. I'm not taking the salvation to make everything right. I'm not making the salvation so that this habit I can now have the victory over. But I'm standing to the foot of the cross and realizing and being confronted with the very reality is, do I believe him? Do I trust in him? Do I have my faith in him? It is a conviction of a sin of unbelief. I can say this as surely, once we get that taken care of, once we put our trust in that right person, the person of Christ, very work can accomplish work at the cross. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and enables us to have the victory in all these other areas. But I, I do fear that there's a lot of gospel presentations that are given just sort of for the soul victory over that sin. We haven't brought them to the cross. They fixed up their life in that sin, convinced that they're saved. They don't have that struggle anymore. They have not stood at the foot of the cross yet, been challenged by the very reality of the sin of unbelief. Oh yeah, they're no longer uh, relying on the bottle anymore. They're no longer uh, pumping drugs into their veins anymore. And, wow, by the grace of God, but have you considered the reality of unbelief? The work of salvation is a message of sin, the sin of unbelief. Secondly, again, you've heard this already. It's a message of, of righteousness. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, even to the Jew first and also to the Greek, it is the gospel of Christ. That of is not an of as in one in possession of. <coughs> as in Christ at the moment was in possession of it. But it is the very word of of that means that he alone is the essence of the gospel. In other words, there is no other gospel outside of Christ. Again, it's not a matter of how I rid myself of all those bad habits. But have I understood the very reality of what, what true righteousness is? Not my good works. The true righteousness is found in the very reality of who he is. Now there's a discussion at a business meeting about vacation Bible school. And back when we had vacation Bible school meeting regularly, usually the Wednesday before we had vacation Bible school, the whole Wednesday night, one of the only messages that I have repeated, <laughs> I did a year after year, that Wednesday night before vacation Bible school, we spent the whole night how to lead a child of Christ. 
I think it is so important that we grasp the truths, how easy it is to lead a child to Christ, and how we can easily lead them along. So you want to get saved, right? Yeah, I do. Uh, so raise your hand. Okay, I'll raise my hand. So, so come forward. Oh, I don't know, I'll come forward. Say this prayer. Okay, I'll say whatever you want me to say. And, and then they look up at you and say, now what am I should do? Now, now what? And it was almost like expecting the eyes. I want to do whatever you want me to say. Whatever I want you, whatever you want me to do. I, I, want, to, I want to please whatever you want me to do. And, and what a challenge that we have as an adult, especially with kids. Remind them that this isn't about us. This isn't about us having a camaraderie with kids. that They want to do it because we want them to. But to take them to the foot of the cross and remind them of who and why they are doing this. And it's a message of righteousness. It's a message of who Christ is. And what I said year after year, do not think you can share the gospel. Do not think that you can lead somebody to Christ and never say the name of Christ. You can't. You're missing the truth. You're missing the point. It is the gospel of Christ. And it is Him alone. And you can't. That's what... The work of the Holy Spirit is, is to direct us to the message of righteousness. The righteousness being of Him. Even in His absence, the righteousness of Him. It's a message of judgment. I once attended a, uh, a teen activity, a large teen activity. The pastor got up, the evangelist got up and preached on hell. And frankly, gave a spectacular uh, message of the horror of hell. And once this passage and that passage and that passage, and he painted a picture and an amazing way of what hell was. And then he clapped his hands and said, everybody, bow your head right now. Raise your hand if you uh, want to go to hell. And they had told all the pastors that were in the you know, you keep your eyes open because I want you to see who's, because there, there's hundreds of kids. So I'm looking around, there's not a single hand. No kids say, oh, yeah, I want to go to hell. But what you just said about hell, yeah, I want to go there. No, not a single hand goes up. So then he says the second question. He claps his hand again. All right. Who in this room wants to make sure they don't want to go to hell? Practically, every hand is now up. If your hand is now up, you come to the side and talk to somebody how they can tell you how to be saved. I remember I, I got, as one of the pastors that ended this arena, uh, I had like a dozen kids that came to me and said, we need to know how to get saved. And I asked them this question, every one of them individually. I took one aside and I said, why? Why? This is, this is the greatest joy in my life to be able to lead you to Christ. But why? I don't want to go to hell. Why will you go to hell? Like I just said, how bad it is. But why do you think you're going to go to hell? I don't know. And, and I was kind of frustrated. <laughs> and I kind of wanted to bang my head against the wall. Like, Preacher, evangelist, why did you do Why did you do that? This is not about a, a judgment of, of hell, of scaring the daylights out of people and saying, you don't want to go there, do you? So raise your hand and say this prayer. Where's Christ in that? Where did he go? We're having a message of fire, but we're losing out on the message of hope, the message of life, the message of Christ. And out of those 12 kids, I, I then gathered them all together and said, all right, here's the truth. You guys are scared to death about hell, correct? You, know? you can see their eyes. Their, their eyes are bugging out of their heads. I've never heard hell described in such a way. I don't want to go there. And I said, well, here's the reason why you're going to go. That's because you're a sinner. In the eyes of God, you're a sinner. How many of you believe that? One kid. One out of the 12 raised his hand. Tears running down his face. I am. I'm a sinner. And I looked at the other 11 and I said, you guys, you guys are all right then? You, know, you think you're all pretty good? They literally said, oh, yep, all right. And I don't, you know, you have to be, you have to be right, you have to be righteous, you have to be kind of gracious, but in my head, I'm trying to say, get back to your seat then, you missed the point. You know, what, what are you doing? What a joy it was then to take that one kid. And I said, all right, something love it. you guys say, yeah, I'll be right back. Get that one kid off into the cornfield and share with him what Christ did because he was a sinner. And to see the joy of his heart instantaneously to know he was saved. I went back to the 11 men and shared with them, hey, you want to tell them what just happened? And he's just with joy in their heart. You wouldn't believe it. And he gave, he gave a testimony that, I, I hate to say this, but in his 30-second testimony, it was much stronger than an entire hour message that I just heard about the reality of hell. And those 11 kids, all of them said, 
Yes, ma'am, over here. Notice of judgment is a part of the reality of the salvation and what the Holy Spirit is doing and convicting. But we have to be reminded of that it is it is the message of hope, it's the message of life, it's the message of Christ. And this whole reality of judgment was uh, hell was created for our devil and uh, our adversary <laughs> and the third that followed after him. And it's for all those who refuse to believe. But belief goes much farther than just believing that hell is a bad place and I don't want to go there. Message of judgment. Uh, boy, judgment is a formidable force. Our entire justice system is built on it. Uh, we went for a drive yesterday and I made sure, well, besides the weather, it didn't allow me to, but I made sure I didn't speed. Why? Because I don't want to take it. <laughs> Uh, the whole justice system, the whole legal system, the whole police system is based on uh, there's consequences. And uh, I've learned that I don't like those consequences. I've paid a speeding ticket before and it wasn't fun. I have other things I could spend a hundred and whatever dollars on and I, I don't like to do it just because I was going too fast. The Holy Spirit can base of sin because they believe not of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So they need to be reminded of Christ is of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is judged. What a great testimony we have with the Holy Spirit. The very adversary of ours is judged. There's the judgment that's involved. But very quickly, not only the creation of the world, the work of salvation is very the master of salvation, you could really say. But as well, this is an advance here we go. Here's my responsibility to live. Here's your responsibility. If you're a child of God, here's your responsibility to live. And here's where we get back to is this a preference or a conviction? Back to verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come on to what's the next word? You. <coughs> Who does? Whom? Who? 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 Whatever the right pronoun is there. Who does the Holy Spirit dwell in? The church, the believer. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit does the work of convicting of sin, the convicting of righteousness, the convicting of judgment, in whom, I think I have that right, in whom does he do that work to the world? Us. It is through me that the Holy Spirit resides in me and the child of God, correct? The Holy Spirit has a work of convicting the world, the lost and dying world, of which he does not reside, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But who does he use to do that? Us. It's us. Convictions or preferences? What ways has my life, now I'm not saying this in a put my nose up in the air and start pointing fingers at everybody, you skinners! <laughs> but in what way has my life been such that my leaving out the truth of the Word of God, not as a preference, but as a conviction, thus saith God, and the Holy Spirit resided in me, in what ways has a lost and dying world been convicted of their unbelief? Now again, it's not because of me, it's because the Holy Spirit was in me. And so it's not me in the flesh, but it's the Holy Spirit within me. But I'm the vessel. What ways has the Holy Spirit been able to use me to convict the lost and dying world of their unbelief? And I guess the question would be, how can I make sure that I'm living such a life? In what ways is the Holy Spirit, as me as the vessel, again, it's not me doing this, it's not about our news order at all, it's about our Lord living through me, through the Holy Spirit, but in what ways has the world been convicted of the very reality of true righteousness? Not my righteousness, not their righteousness, but his righteousness. Conviction? Preference. In what ways have I lived out the very reality that we are the victors, not the victims? We are the victors. Our adversary has already been. His, his punishment has, and his judgment has already been declared. We are the victor. We sing victory in Jesus. 812, I think it is 816. One of those 800 there in our hymnals. One of my favorite hymns, Victory in Jesus. 
But isn't the sad reality we sing victory in Jesus in here and then we go on as victims? My responsibility to live. Let me close this invitation or uh, this illustration, and uh, I'll close with this. I am not a. Uh, I am not a. Oh, let me just say it this way. Among independent fundamental Baptist churches, there's a lot of uh, uh, kind of nitpicking and uh, uh, <coughs> criticism that is made of, of others who, especially, are not necessarily standing where we stand. I think Billy Graham has become one of those that oftentimes is. And part. You should have done it this way, you should have done it this way. And, and honestly, as it comes into towns, well, not anymore, but when he would, uh, and all churches had to be united or he wouldn't come. And the differences that are, you know, you have Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans and Catholics all having to be required to come together as one. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of, uh, really, I'm not making this all work out. But at the same point, I can't, I can't ignore the very reality that there were lives that were transformed. I, I know that my grandmother. Uh, was saved, I believe, at a Billy Graham revival. And uh, because of her salvation, then she led her two kids to the Lord. Years later, her husband. And uh, many years later, her grandkids uh, would also then uh, enjoy the, the fruits of, of the cross, we'll say it that way. But here's an illustration that I found. President Gerald Ford. It's recorded as playing a golf tournament with the likes of Jack Nicholas, Billy Graham, and a couple of other celebrity golfers. After the tournament, one of the other pros that was not selected to be on such a prestigious team with the president ran up to one of those that was, and the question was this. If he liked, if he enjoyed, how is it to golf with those guys? <laughs> Can you imagine golfing with the president? Um, unless it was miniature golf, I would... They're saying that it's not something that I would probably do because I've never golfed before in my life. But I can't imagine being a, a golfer of, of great esteem, being able to golf with the president, Jack Nicholas, and Billy Graham. And uh, so anyway, he ran up to this one guy and he said, what was that like? And his re immediate response was this, and I, I have a quote here. I don't need Billy Graham shoving his religion down my throat. And uh, the... Uh, the guy that asked the question was kind of somewhat taken back, and his next question was, what did he talk about? What did he do to you? And you're kind of horrified. This was his next response, and I quote, he didn't even mention religion. Let me read that again. He didn't even mention religion. It was just his very presence there on the golf course with him was bringing conviction to this guy, and he finishes... Although the, pre or the president and Jack Nicholas and, and uh, Billy Graham are talking about golf and the weather and probably sports and all the other things, never even brought up the topic of religion. There was one pro golfer that came to the end and said, I have enough of this religion. Never spoke about it. But he was there. And just his very presence brought this Pro golfer to his knees and said, I had enough of this religion. He's selling it down my throat. Well, he never actually said a word about it. It's just his life irritated me because he lived out Christ in front of me. How dare him do that and shove it down my throat? You know, I wish that someday after I'm gone, someone will share a testimony and say, I just hated being around that army this morning. Shoving his religion down my throat. And I hope that someone comes, I hope somebody comes up and says, Oh yeah, he did share with me. <laughs> he shared with me the gospel. But I hope there's instances where people will say, No, he never had to bring up the word religion. He never had to bring up his faith. He was just there. And it irritated the daylights out of me. Conviction, preference. What are we doing? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for all you've done for us and through us. I pray that you would challenge our hearts. That we'd understand the very uh, the privilege that we have. Certainly the benefit, as the disciples are learning in this very passage, of the benefit of Christ's departure, of your departure, so that they can have the Holy Spirit within them. And the very responsibility, the very actions, the very work that the Holy Spirit would do in and through them. And I pray that we wouldn't forget the very work of the Holy Spirit that's being done in and through us. I pray that as we examine our hearts, examine our faith, and examine our 
what we call convictions, that we would truly understand whether or not they truly are convictions or if they are just mere preferences in our life. Things that we will quickly back away from if any pressure is put on them. Things that we will quickly change our mind on if nobody else gains with us. I pray that we live such a life that even by our very presence, without even speaking a word, the very reality of Christ will use out of us. And I pray that you would use us, that you would stretch us, that we would be able to be vessels in your hand, and we thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes? I want to circle back to your talking about um, conviction and you know, attorney pointing and saying, yes. well, you're not doing this, and you're not doing this, and you're not doing this. Yes. Because that right there leads you to the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. okay. That's true too, yes. That, so you almost have to start with judgment. Yes. Because every one of us will stand before the yes. good judge, and he's going to do what good judges do. He's going to convict us. Correct. Okay. Yes. And then it's it then circles back to belief on Christ and his righteousness. Pay it all. It's like my sentence has been commuted because someone else has correct. taken it for me. That is correct. That is very true. And again, I think uh, kind of continuing on that, that I'll very mention I said how many times we defeated as victims. Um, our adversary wants to remind us, hey, you're convicted. You're a failure. You, you messed up. You, you, you're guilty as charged. Uh, what, do we live out such a life that uh, as others look at us, they're not seeing hypocrisy where we're putting up a facade of righteousness. But they're seeing the very reality of victory because of Christ, not because of me, because of Christ. Excellent point. That's, that's what it means to rest in Christ. Yes. Yes. Yes, we need to live righteously, yes. but we are unable to. Correct. And you, know, you, you get back up again, you get back Correct. up again, you get yes. back up again, but you rest in Christ. Yes. Yes. Was the, I read somewhere something about a wise man gets knocked down sometimes, something like that. He rises up once or twice, something like that. <laughs> so, so, well, well. Uh, yeah, the very truth is yes. How, how are we living that out? Not, not, we, ought not, we ought to be genuine. I'll say it that way. We ought to be genuine. I've mentioned before, I guess I'm tearing here, but I've mentioned before one of the things that I love about the Winches down here in Winch. I have never met somebody whose faith is more genuine than they are because they are so willing to admit when they fail. And sometimes you think to yourself, you do not just tell me that. You just not, you just do not just admit that. You're not supposed to say that. You're not, you're not, supposed, to, you're not supposed to talk to like, no. And I, I love that about them because they, they exactly what you just said. Hey, we're not perfect. <laughs> we don't pretend to be. We do really serve a God who is. His righteousness has declared us perfect. And what a challenge. And, and what a heart that they have too. That it's not just, well, you know, we're just who we are then. But we're striving to live after Christ. We serve after Christ. And get back up. And uh, what a joy that we have. My daughter picked out our hymns today because of our schedule yesterday, and uh, I think I had to change the last song, and then we went to uh, which which one of the anyway channels only was one of the songs that we sing. It would be a perfect conclusion, but then we have to mess everything else up. But hold that thought of what we were just talking about. I realized that in the afternoon we're going to sing channels only, but right now we're very kind of sing. I need the I have that on the way for eight hundred and sixteen. Well, same as we sing eight hundred and sixteen half that only. 